Yeah, good evening. Uh, welcome, my friends, to the Museum of Newport Irish History in conjunction with Villanova University. Uh, welcome to this, our second Michael Crowley lecture of this 2020-2021 season. I'm Mike Slane, and I have the privilege of leading a dedicated board of directors here in Newport, Rhode Island, and carrying out the mission of the Museum of Newport Irish History. And tonight's product highlights two of those individuals, Ann Arnold May, who is the coordinator, the organizer of the lecture series, and Dan Titus, who's the technical wizard behind the scene and sitting next to me here tonight. We welcome nearly 150 signed up in the audience, uh, of which nearly one third uh, from the students of Villanova University Wildcats. So welcome aboard to all of the students at the University of Villanova. Also in the audience are several friends and relatives of Dr. Lennon to include uh, his cousins, Karen Kaufman and our city manager, Joe Nicholson. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this tonight, when I look at the topic of the lecture series, the subject, Terence McSwiney, the Lord Mayor of Cork City in 1920, our board member, Maeve Sheehan, brother, Dr. John Sheehan, was the, was the Lord Mayor of Cork City up until June of 2020. He just recently turned over the reins and she is in the audience as well tonight. Now we welcome a distinguished Villanova professor, Dr. Joseph Lennon, who's the Emily C. Riley Director of Center for Irish Studies and also Associate Dean in the College of Liberal Arts. He writes on Irish literature, poetry, and Irish culture, and is an award-winning author. He was educated at Knox College, received his master's degrees from Northern Illinois University and Boston College, where he graduated with honors, and received, earned his doctorate degree with distinction from the University of Connecticut. He's most proud of his ties to Newport, where he was raised as an infant and told me that he lived on Old Beach Road. His grandparents resided at 27 Harrison Ave, one of the most Irish streets in all of the United States. And he and his brothers returned during college, during summers during college, where they worked at just about every restaurant in Newport. It covers the entire waterfront down there. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to Dr. Joseph Lennon and his University of Illinois Wildcats. Thank Welcome, you. doctor. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Th and thank you. Uh, thanks everybody for being here on a Friday night. I know this is, uh, we're in the middle of a crazy week and I hope everybody has, uh, is going to enjoy a little break from that. I'm gonna share my screen um, so that I can put a PowerPoint up. Let's see. Tell me, is that working, Mike? Yep, we can see it. Great. Okay, so thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, as Mike alluded, I was born in Newport and it's still the hometown of my heart. I'd like to begin by thanking Ann Arnold, Ann Arnold May, Mike, Mike Slane, Dan Titus, as well as Kirsten Ludi at Villanova for their work in making this event happen. I also want to acknowledge um, two of my mother's cousins, Karen Kaufman and the late Mary Sampson, both of whom is, um, as members of the museum uh, recommended me for this talk. Karen was my first babysitter and I wish I could have returned to Rhode Island to see you, Karen, and everyone else in person. Um, also, in addition to rem remembering Mary Sampson, um, whose energy inspired so many, I'd like to remember her father, Joseph Nicholson, whose son is here tonight. I was named after his father and my grandmother, his sister, Mary, uh, or Mame or Nikki Pedro would have been 101 on November 4th. Um, thanks to them and my grandfather, Tony Pedro, as well as my parents, Donna Pedro Lennon and J. Michael Lennon. Um, I've developed a keen sense of what it is to be Irish in America. My talk tonight concerns memory and the, and the foundations of Irish America, and it's a pleasure to be with you all. Some of this material I've published in the third volume of a work called Memory Ireland, um, a four volume project edited by Una Frowley. 
That includes scholarship from dozens of Irish study scholars from around the world. I take as my main topic the funerals of Terence McSweeney, the Lord Mayor of Cork, who died 100 years ago this past October in a Brixton prison on hunger strike. Collective memory differs from history and historiography in some key respects. First, it is more vague with less definable elements of causation. For years, historians moved away from studying collective memory because of its amorphousness and unreliability. But sometimes these less definable forces that motivate larger uh, cultural and political ones are, are, I find, the most worth studying. Sometimes we can track them down in their multiplicity, that is, where they appear broadly and widely in the imaginations of writers, whether writing poetry or journalism. Collective memory, then, is not something that uh, is easily nailed down. Um, I'm interested in how ideas, cultural and political forms, and even sentiments move from one generation to another. Some, something passes on between generations. Um, sometimes this is a joy and is guided by curiosity and love. Here's my grandmother, a daughter of Irish immigrants there um, from West Cork, and my son, Sean Allen, born in Philadelphia, sharing a moment on Harrison Avenue in uh, 2017. But of course, at other times, memory carries trauma and painful memories. As a scholar of literary, intellectual, and cultural history, I'm interested in what carries across generation and how memory influences culture. And even when what arrives is only silence. For many years in the 19th and 20th century, few scholars and writers wrote more than passing references to Angorta Moore, the Irish famine or great hunger of the late 1840s. Maurice Halbwachs, a, a French social scientist and philosopher, died at Buchenwald after protesting the arrest of his Jewish father-in-law. His scholarship, much of it published after his death, developed this concept of collective memory and its transmission. I wanna talk about a series of funerals that memorialized one man, uh, but also spoke to millions about the death of millions two generations previously. Um, a couple of quotes by uh, Halbox are, are helpful for us tonight. Um, the first, collective memory is not the same as formal history. An historical memory is a rather unfortunate expression because it connects two terms opposed in more than one aspect. And general history starts only when tradition ends and the social memory is fading or breaking up. So long as remembrance continues to exist, it is useless to set it down in writing or otherwise fix it in memory. And this is really part of the key of, of why I'm interested in um, understanding where Memory, the memories of hunger and hunger strikes come from, um, because it's not, it's not an absolute uh, direct set of links in a chain. Collective memory is a current of continuous thought whose continuity is not at all artificial, for it retains from the past only what still lives or is capable of living in the consciousness of the groups keeping the memory alive. And then lastly, this um, last thought about collective memory in the present. The present is not contrasted to the past in the way two neighboring historical periods are distinguished. Rather, the past no longer exists, whereas for the historian, the two periods have equivalent reality. So what, what we're suggesting here um, is, or that what Halbox is suggesting, is that if history can look at periods uh, as contained and even look at the present um, within a sense of a broader history, cultural memory is a more organic, um, fluid, uh, fluid thing that's harder to study. Uh, for the past decade, I've been researching how the memory of hunger, the practice of fasting, and the politics of oppression have led to the creation of the modern hunger strike. No one people or culture owns the hunger strike, but many have claimed inspiring its origin. In the fall of 1920, daily newspapers around the world told the story of the starvation of a man, the death of Terence McSweeney, the Lord Mayor of Cork, on October 25th, 1920, just over 100 years ago, on the 74th day of his hunger strike in England's Brixton prison. This spurred an unprecedented level of collective mourning in the Irish diaspora. And I'm, I'm clear to call that collective mourning because often in the scholarship, it's seen as, um, as a manifestation of politics alone. As such, though, as collective mourning, this remains a unique event in Irish and Irish-American history. 
more than a million people, more than a million people, especially at that time, in Ireland and around the world, gathered on streets, in churches, and in stadiums to mourn the famished body of this Republican mayor, whether his body was there or in absence. Uh, he was actually buried in Cork, but these gatherings um, were held all over the world. They supported the nationalist cause at the height of the fighting in the Anglo-Irish War. The evocation of hunger and starvation at a time of national crisis tapped into deep memories of Irish famine. The morning took the form of processional marches with or without McSweeney's body in London, Dublin, Cork, Boston, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, Buenos Aires, Melbourne, and other cities around the world with large Irish populations. It also riveted much of continental Europe. In Cork, where his wake and actual funeral took place, tens of thousands of mourners peacefully crowded the police lined streets in what seemed an endless stream. In Boston, a quarter million viewers lined the streets to watch a 30,000 member commemorative march. In Chicago, funeral dirges echoed eerily through the downtown as mourners maintained silence for long stretches. In New York, stadiums filled for monster meetings and 60,000 marchers crowded the streets while hundreds of thousands have watched in Philadelphia as well. The form, tenor, and magnitude of these events suggest they were about more than the death of one man. McSweeney's memorial seemed to, have been ca seemed to have catalyzed rebellion in Ireland, garnered support for the diaspora, for the nationalist cause. Indeed, this was the turning point in the war when the Americans got much more involved um, in pressuring the British to, to come to closure, uh, as well as, um, as others around the world. The memorials also seem to have offered a catharsis for the families of famine survivors still marked by the trauma of hunger, desolation, and immigration. Irish journalists, commentators, and writers have drawn links, if cautiously, between the hunger strike and haunting memories of starvation. So a little bit more about McSweeney um, and uh, just some background. Three days after the Restoration of Order in Ireland Act came into effect on August 9th, 1920, McSweeney was arrested for possessing a police cipher. He immediately announced his hunger strike. He had just become Lord Mayor um, following close on the death of Tom Tomas McCurtain, uh, the previous Lord Mayor of Cork, who had been assassinated in his home by a gang of masked men, um, normally assumed to have been members of the RIC, the Royal Irish Constabulary. McSweeney immediately knew the importance of his hunger strike being prolonged and played out in newspapers. While in prison, he wrote to his wife that, quote, public opinion carries great weight yet. McSweeney's death was prolonged in order to better capture the public eye. The careful care of his physician, his daily taking of communion, and his own efforts to conserve energy allowed his fast to continue for a remarkable 73 days, which is still considered a record uh, a, a grim record um, in hunger strike history. McSweeney hoped that he would be released as he and other un Irish hunger strikers had previously been set free. But following a new incarnation of the act of coercion that took effect three days before McSweeney's arrest, British officials felt they could not concede this time and set him free. As Francis Costello was carefully argued in Enduring the Most, which if you want a good history on McSweeney, I would recommend this. McSweeney, um, um, this was not his first arrest, um, but it was his first arrest as Lord Mayor of Cork. He had been on hunger strike before, and he imagined the strike would be over soon, saying, I shall be free, alive or dead, within a month at his tribunal. But the arrest became a match of wills for the British government and Irish prisoners. Eleven other Irish uh, IRA prisoners were on a coordinated hunger strike in Cork jail led by Michael Fitzgerald, who died on October 17th, 1920, eight days before McSweeney. Another Cork hunger striker died a few hours after McSweeney, the Massachusetts-born Joseph Murphy uh, on October 25th, 1920 also. Soon afterward, Arthur Griffith called off the strike for the remaining nine, all of whom complied. In the news around the world, the deaths of these other two men in Cork provided not only the triptych of Calvary iconography for McSweeney's martyrdom, but they also gave the Irish nationalist story a sense that the Lord Mayor's death was preceded and followed by other starvations. This anticipa the anticipation of his death had built during the 73 days of his hunger strike, and the reverberation continued for two months in the United States while his wife and, 
and sister visited. The metaphor that had guided McSweeney's self-starvation was not that of famine, disease, and immigration. It was that of surrender relating to the Catholic mass and the last supper. His bodily evocation of hunger, however, could not but evoke the Irish famine of the 1840s and, and even later um, shortages in the 1870s. His off-quoted inauguration speech mentions a common theme found in depictions of hunger, one that passed on through generations of famine survivors, endurance. I, so here, here's the, uh, the, the quote. I wish to point out again, the secret of our strength and the assurance of our final, I'm starting to sound like Joe Biden here, and the assurance of our final victory. This contest of ours is not on our side, a rivalry of vengeance, but one of endurance. It is not they who can inflict the most, but they who can suffer the most, who will conquer. Though we do not abrogate our function to demand and see that evildoers and murderers are punished for their crimes, those whose faith is strong will endure to the end and triumph. McSweeney did not invent the hunger strike. However, his was preceded by many others in the previous decade, beginning in 1909 with the suffragette um, hunger strike campaign in London and that of Marion Wallace Dunlop, who I've been <laughs> writing on for years. And here's a, uh, a photo that she took in a photo booth years ago in 1908. Irish national hunger strikes began with James Connolly's in 1913 followed by those of Eamon de Valera in 1916, McSweeney's first was in 1917, and Thomas Ashe, who died after complications from force feeding in 1917. And here's an image um, of the, uh, the firing party at the grave of, of Ashe. More prominently in 1920 in April, only a few months before his second strike, Frank Gallagher and 88 other Irish prisoners went on a very public hunger strike that brought much of Ireland to a halt through a general strike and sympathy with the prisoners. But something differed um, in Fitzgerald Mur Mc Murphy and McSweeney strikes and marked a first in hunger strike history. They all died of starvation. Sorry, I just wanted to point that. So 1909, and this is from the Daily Mirror. This is the first uh, use of the, of the word hunger strike as a headline in the newspaper. Um, and then Thomas Ashe is in 1917. Um, Frank Gallagher, when he, after he survived his hunger strike and got out, he wrote a very uh, moving and disturbing book called Days of Fear. Um, and in it, there's, I just want to point to a quote here. Ireland is the dead and the things the dead would have done. Ireland is the living and the things the living would die for. Ireland is the spirit. It is the tradition of laughing courage upon laughing courage of men upon whose heads the pitch cap has been placed by fiends. It is the tradition of undefeat, of indomitable failure. Um, this is the, this general idea of the laughing courage of the dying is something I, I will return to um, when we talk about McSweeney. So a little bit about the famine. Um, in the early 20th, in early 20th century Ireland in the Irish diaspora, the awareness of the famine years influenced the tenor of much nationalist recollection. Even as famine stories subsided, as the generation of survivors passed, particularly following the 1916 Easter Rising, hunger, however, remained near the surface. The ideological cornerstones of political and cultural leaders continued to reflect the trauma of a lost generation, a fractured culture and a catastrophe too complex to summarily represent. Um, and here's a few representations, two from the time um, from observers during the famine and the central one from 1880 um, a, a, about the famine uh, in uh, Harper's, uh, an American publication. Theorists of memory have argued that past collective trauma such as famine forces a, com a communal need to mourn, revisit, or act out the past. And famine memories were not at the center of public and official mourning during McSweeney's hunger strike, funeral, and commemorations, but they were occasionally associated uh, in the minds of writers and in the words of writers, uh, particularly Frank Gallagher, James Stevens, W.B. Yeats, and James Joyce. And I'm gonna turn to some of their writings in, in a few slides uh, to talk about how hunger was internalized at the moment when McSweeney was on hunger strike. 
The pervasive silence in the written discourse of the famine in Irish culture, particularly around 1920, but also for decades previous, makes evidence difficult to find. This may sound strange to people, but people were not writing about the famine in Ireland. Silence pervaded, even though memories endured. One lifetime after the famine, few individuals had firsthand memories. Some novels did exist. Famine by um, um, Liam O'Flaherty uh, is, is a notable one. But millions of second and third generation Irish, particularly in the North American diaspora, grew up in households and communities suffused with references to that foundational catastrophe of Irish America. Images of hunger and starvation haunted Irish cultures, as well as texts written in the months around McSweeney's hunger strike. Sometimes these are oblique references, and sometimes they're explicit. Between the years 1845 and 52, roughly one million people died of starvation and disease, and another one and a half million left Ireland, the majority going to North America, some going to England and, and the continent and Australia. These bleak facts do not convey the scale of the catastrophe in which Ireland lost a quarter of its population. Indeed, no words or monuments, commemorations can fully represent the famine or provide closure. In Hungry Words, um, a, a book of scholarship, Christopher Marash, a, a theater scholar, notes that, quote, there is a widely shared belief that the famine remained taboo for more than a century, the great unwritten element, event, sorry, of Irish history. The nature of catastrophe suggests that proximity to the cataclysm makes representation much more difficult. Um, and we can think of um, Theodore Adorno, who wrote after Auschwitz that um, uh, poetry is dead, we cannot, we cannot represent um, in the same way that we had in the past. The very nature of representing the scale and the trauma of such an event may be impossible. Um, but I want to suggest that at the time, uh, this profoundly affected people. Um, and I just point to these two, um, well, a couple articles, I'll get to it in a second. The historical moment of McSweeney's hunger strike focused on itself, its newsworthiness and its inspirational power. But this was also the time when the last survivors of the famine of the late 1840s were passing away, when personal memories were fading into Irish collective or social memory. A hunger strike inverts the image of power granting strength to the weaker party by harnessing public opinion. To do this, to do so, painful dynamics and histories must be transformed into sources of strength. Histories of the hunger strike have found it difficult to trace its communal power, um, primarily because modern hunger strikers by necessity have focused their message on their immediate political situation. This is, although Bobby Sands is, is perhaps an exception on some, on some level. The, most of the messaging is always on the political uh, moment. The power of the hunger strike is in its dramatic immediacy, particularly as it's often reported to the press on a daily basis. We know that it profoundly affected people. Um, here's an image, McSweeney's face seen uh, in a wall um, and McSweeney's aunt um, hearing the banshee um, in, in the hours leading up to his death. An article appeared after McSweeney's death entitled The Ancient Hunger Strike. And I'm very interested in this and, and what the connections were. These arguments were meant to historicize the hunger strike outside of the famine and ennoble the strike by providing an ancient Irish history rooted in Gaelic tradition. While the tradition certainly existed, it existed in a much different form. Um, in writing, sorry, I'll just, pause on this for a second. Um, in Ireland, I'm in the second paragraph here. Um, in Ireland today, its recurrence takes on for those who know Irish legend, the character of repeated episode in one long epic tradition. Um, and I could talk, I could spend another 40 minutes just talking about the, the history of the hunger strike, but I want to keep moving on. Um, in writing on the sociology of hunger strikes, Michael Biggs concludes that a hunger striker's death is seen as more potent than other kinds of martyred deaths, but remarks on an absence of famine commentary in 1920. One might expect explicit references to starvation in the Great Famine, but I've not seen this. In McSweeney's hunger strike, if McSweeney's hunger strike signified the famine dead, an explicit connection in writing to the mass starvation is missing and significant. The absent referent of mass starvation um, the unsaid in Irish tradition carries great freight. His funeral and the commemorations that followed his death in cities across the world allowed mourners to remember the famine, however. Um, 
hunger in an Irish context is always laden with a feeling that what has come before may come again, particularly in 1920. In the early 20th century, endurance was therefore savored as a remedy and sacrifice and endurance became morally superior to comfort. Um, so that was De Terence McSweeney's coffin leaving Brixton prison and, and here is the Dublin procession. It was meant to go into Dublin, um, but it was circumvented to Cove and, uh, and then the actual procession was in Cork. So back to memory for a second. Um, absence and silence to borrow from uh, Paul Ricoeur, who's a, who's a French scholar, is at times a way of preventing a more radical forgetting. It provides a way of digesting, swallowing, and embodying painful collective memories. Ricoeur notes that some collective memories trouble and haunt a culture more, the hauntedness that stigmatizes a past that does not pass. And his memorable quote, hauntedness is to collective memory what hallucination is to private memory, an incrustation of the past at the heart of the present. In 1920, the term famine in Irish newspapers and culture had become far less specific than its meaning today. It was often used as a synonym for shortage, its catastrophic connotations reduced as newspapers such as the Irish Times reported on fam famines or shortages in paper, milk, petrol, coal, train cars, housing. Um, news reports of famines across the world and famine aid also appeared frequently in the press and reports of famine and famine related conditions in Petrograd, Mesopotamia, Central Europe and China appeared in newspapers frequently that year. But the trace of the catastrophic famine existed in the ubiquity of the term, even in its denial as something unique to Ireland, even in the calls to provide the famine support that lacked 70 years previously. Such usage may also suggest an understandable wish to escape the memory, to denude famine of its trauma by making it more commonplace, by contextualizing it. But famine was not so easily defanged. Um, so after searching through hundreds and thousands of texts, I found a journalist on an Irish, from an Irish immigrant community who openly compared McSweeney's hunger strike to the famine. One correspondent from the Manchester Guardian then reprinted it uh, in the Boston Globe, um, wrote, it, I mean, it opens, in these days when Terence McSweeney is lingering on, we have been haunted by the feeling of impending doom, doom as when in the Irish fields the blight foretold the famine. Through one's, one man's hunger, the catastrophe returns for the newspaper readers. If McSweeney's famishment provided a dark screen on which, or a blank screen on which mourners could see the victims of the famine, particularly the generation who had survived and died recently, individual writers also found ways of representing the famine, reclaiming it as a force. And I just wanna to touch on three different writers um, uh, whose, whose work I know and, um, who wrote in particular about hunger. Um, James Stevens wrote uh, a very powerful story about hunger in 1918. Um, but when McSweeney was dying, Stevens was in the hospital with gastric ulcer, ulcer, ulcers. And he wrote a short story, the story of Tuan McCarroll, which is a rewriting of um, something from the mythological cycle. And in this, um, here's just a few quotes that I thought significant. Be at peace all of you, he said, for hunger has a whip and he will drive the stranger away in the night. Let the past be content with itself for man needs forgetfulness as well as memory. And this is what I suggest is McSweeney's hunger strike is bringing up for, for Stevens. One time I came drawn by that intoler intolerable anguish of memory and all of these people were gone. The place that knew them was silent and the land where they had moved there was nothing of them but their bones that glinted in the sun. A great, um, an underappreciated writer, James Stevens. Um, uh, W.B. Yeats, um, his, he wrote the most famous um, hunger strike play, um, uh, The King's Threshold. And this is perhaps the most famous representation. It was first performed in 1903 and then again in 1904 in Dublin when it was, um, was first performed in London and then it was printed here. In this drama, the protest is presented as a medieval practice based on Irish legends and hunger striking is depicted as idealistic and outmoded. 
the plot that follows the hunger strike of Shankan, a legendary court poet whose place at the king's table had been removed at the outset of the play. In Yeats's original version, Guar the king capitulates in the end and admits the power of poetry. So in this play, in the first version, there's my fancy screen raising, um, uh, curtain raising. Um, so in 1903, um, the production, which we're fortunate to have an image of, um, Shankin does not die. Um, when Terence McSweeney was dying, Yeats rethought the ending to his own hunger strike play and rewrote it, giving it a tragic ending. And he very explicitly notes um, that McSweeney was the inspiration for this. And there's been a good bit of scholarship on this. But so in the 1920 version, Shankin dies a martyr. I just want to drill down for a second, um, just as the literary, as the English professor here, uh, just to look at a couple of a couple of things. McSweeney prompted Yeats to rewrite this, um, and an, an image of of a dying hero can be seen in Terence McSweeney's own play, *The Revolutionist*. And I wanted to point to that image that I that um, Frank Gallagher um, referenced earlier of the of the smiling dead person. Um, this is not the image that we have of the famine, but this is one that um, we see in, in The Revolutionist, and then later we see in um, W.B. Yeats. At the end of McSweeney's play, um, although he did not write directly about famine, he writes about how hunger and fever dogged his characters, especially the main idealist character, Hugh, the revolutionist, who dies bewildered and exhausted. At the end of McSweeney's play, um, Hugh's friend, priest, and doctor gather around his dead body, and the priest states rather flatly, he's very beautiful. The stage directions say more, however. Hugh's face is strangely beautiful. The last struggle forced the blood to his face. It has not entirely receded and leaves a color behind with this, an effect strangely natural. His expression is quiet and happy with the trace of a smile. The, the lines of pain are smoothed out. Um, and that, that mise-en-scene there and that right at the, the height of this play, um, at the climax, is where Yeats borrows from uh, when he rewrites his play. Perhaps a little more dramatically, um, he writes at the end, to lie there with uncovered face a while, that mankind and leper there may know, dead faces laugh. King, king, dead faces laugh. King, he is dead. Um, some train triumphant thought, so that I cannot see his face or any that cried him towards his death. Dead faces laugh, the ancient right is gone, the new remains, and that is death. Yeats understood the power of McSweeney's symbolic death and found a way to link the success of martyrdom into the lines of the new ending, um, he, which he called more, quote, tragically appropriate. The new lines do seem out of place when you're reading the play, unless you take into account McSweeney's own um, thought uh, and image of the, of the dead smiling faces. James Joyce, um, and I regret that I don't have any women authors that I'm referencing here. Um, I, I did look and um, I did not find, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, clear references. I do write about Ethnic Harbury um, and, and others, but not she died before Terence McSweeney. Um, James Joyce, even further removed from Ireland than Yeats, was also affected by McSweeney's death. Yeats was in London at the time, and he linked it more explicitly to famine. Joyce had been following the events in Cork since the previous Lord Mayor of Cork, Tomas McCurtain, was assassinated. But as Richard Elman notes in his biography of Joyce, during the last two years of the fight for Irish independence, his only, the only incident that stirred Joyce's imagination was the hunger strike of the Lord Mayor of Cork, Terence McSweeney, possibly a distant relation. The Joyce's were from Cork in 1920. Joyce wandered Paris that summer, keeping his family in cheap rooms that Ezra Pound had found for them, borrowing money, clothes, and a bed for his son. Um, on July 15th, 1920, he wrote to James Pinker inquiring about an overdue installment on his advance for Ulysses. And he notes his penury saying, the result to me is as disastrous as I am here with my family without any means of existence. And as matters stand at present, unless they reach me by Tuesday, I do not see any way to live. Now, um, 
Terence McSweeney's hunger strike a month later seems to have resonated deeply as he struggled with the Circe chapter of Ulysses throughout the summer and fall. And here's a quote from that, that chapter of his most famous book. Um, in this chapter, Stephen views his mother in his mind's eye, rising through the floor, emaciated and covered with, quote, grave mold. Her hair is scant and lank. She fixes her blue circled hollowed eyes on Stephen and opens her toothless mouth uttering a silent word. Uh, Stephen filled with guilt is tortured by, his, by her memory and the image of her body echoes that of the famine dead. Another main character, Leopold Bloom in this same chapter carries a potato around in his pocket as a talisman. And there, there's so many references to the famine scholars have pointed out, others have pointed out, I won't belabor the point. I wanna close with one, with one poem um, and then a few reflections. Um, so famine was on Joyce's mind and he directly linked Terence McSweeney's hunger strike to a famine in a poem that he wrote on a postcard to his brother, the right heart in the wrong place. So let me just read this poem. And this is not one that's, that's a well-known poem, um, but we can, the, the connection is explicit. The right heart in the wrong place of spinach and gammon or, or ham, uh, bacon, of spinach and gammon, bulls full to the crupper. White lice and black famine are the mayor of Cork's supper. But the pride of old Ireland must be damnably humbled if a Joyce is found cleaning the boots of a Rumbold. The jibe in the poem is directed at Rumbold, a, a British civil servant in Zurich with whom Joyce um, had struggled trying to get some paperwork done, but the link between the two forms of hunger is clear. This dog roll poem begins by noting that John Bull or England is full while McSweeney, the Lord Mayor of Cork starves. The reference to McSweeney's hunger strike is followed but quote, Here, I'll, but I'll, I'll the pride you. of old Ireland would be humbled. Gonna, did you say Joyce you? completes the rhyme and sentence with a conditional clause that suggests that Ireland, um, so sorry. Tell people, that, right. yeah, okay. And I'll say, identify yourself one at a time, please. And then you ask a question and then immediately mute yourself, right? Okay, I'm just another couple of minutes here. So um, what, so Joyce, this is from um, Joyce's parodying a, a children's rhyme, a frog he would go a wooing. But the black and white nature of the hunger reminds here of newsprint, um, of print, particularly of newsprint, black and white and red all over. The place where McSweeney's hunger strike played out daily across Ireland, Britain, continental Europe, and the Americas. Black famine also stands for the worst kind of famine. Here it means not merely a shortage, but that which kills and kills on a mass scale. The title of the poem conflates the hearts of both McSweeney and Joyce, being singular, the right heart in the wrong place. Their hearts seem to be misplaced, Joyce prostrating himself to what he calls English officialdom and McSweeney embracing famine in the face of England, recuperating um, this word famine in a sense. So the memory of famine made McSweeney's hunger strike, just to conclude here, um, the memory of famine made McSweeney's hunger strike more pressing for those living a generation after famine survivors. While his hunger strike played out the long unmoored dead, unmourned dead, walked through the news of the day. And I say unmourned because so many of the famine dead um, were not properly buried, were not uh, properly mourned. Um, so many families emigrated, uh, were separated. And this, for, um, for a culture that prides itself on funerals and processions and mourning processes, um, to not have this extended process of mourning, especially for something so grand. Um, it makes sense that we see the power of it in McSweeney's funerals. His death evoked an almost mythic force that had humbled all of Ireland in its power. White lice and black famine are the mayor of Cork's supper. In a sense, by eating famine for supper, McSweeney con conquered it, digested it, embodied it. The process of remembering differs from that of recalling as numerous scholars and commentators have noted back to Aristotle, that we can consciously recall something, but when something is remembered and it comes up naturally, it's a different, it's a different process and, um, and how, we, how we think of things, how we think of the past. 
Terence McSweeney's hunger strike evoked the collective memory of the famine in Ireland and perhaps more important politically throughout the Irish diaspora, which owes its cultural foundation to the great dispersal of people during those years. So um, in Paul Recur's term, McSweeney was standing for famine dead, standing for famine dead, except not by witness, but by embodiment. McSweeney did not recall the famine consciously for the press, but the image of his starvation remembered for millions all the uncountable famine victims, all their dislocated descendants, and the besieged culture of Ireland during the Anglo-Irish War, putting them all onto the body of the Lord Mayor of Cork, famished in a coffin. McSweeney drafted the famine dead into the history of Irish martyrs for Ireland, those who had suffered the most. But he was not only a martyr for the nationalist cause, he was another victim of starvation. But this time the role of the English government was unmistakably clear. He presented before them an image of the famished body that had haunted them. This, however, was not history repeating itself. This was more an uncanny reminder of the past. It was more something that was evoked. This was memory surfacing into the known. So I can go on, but I am also mindful of the time. And I'm also interested in hearing people's questions and comments. Great. So I will stop sharing my screen there for a moment. And I, and I can easily go back. Oh, Mike, I can't hear you. And I may have. Sorry, Mike, I think you're muted. Can you hear me okay now? I can hear you now. Yep. Great. That was uh, that was just superb, Doctor. I I always think of when I view those things of the ultimate sacrifice, mm. such that others that followed after him could have a better life. And boy, it uh, when you when you look at the times then and you compare them with Ireland now, oh, uh, yeah, dark stark well, difference. Sure. There's, and there's, I mean, this is a, an enormous topic, um, both a hunger strike, hunger strike history, nationalist history, um, famine history and famine memory. Um, and so I guess the, the main thing I want to, and I think some people are asking in the chat how to ask questions. I think if you just put them in the question, in the chat, I can answer them. Um, is or that I, right? Yeah, or, or we, uh, Dan Titus is, uh, they should be able to hear me now. What I'd like people to do is uh, they can go into the chat or they can identify themselves one at a time, ask the question and then mute themselves. So here from Ted, why when so many people starved in the famine was one man's life so important? That's exactly the question. Um, the, the, in a sense, the, what had happened 80 years previously um, was something that had never been fully uh, mourned, fully processed on a cultural level, on a collective level. And when Terence McSweeney's death very publicly um, was written about and shared and discussed and then uh, organized um, as in, in terms of funeral processions, this evoked the memory. This is what I'm arguing. And it, it evoked this collective mourning. So it's, it would be illogical and, and crazy to say that his death was, was more important. Um, but what happened was his death began to stand in for all of the, the millions of, um, of famine dead. I hope that makes sense. Are there any verbal questions outside the chat? Anybody does have the ability to unmute themselves now? Yo, uh, this this is Angus, Angus Lawler. Um, oh, hi, Angus. You refer to Tatu. Jaren Tatu, I should say. <laughs> um, you refer briefly to the fact that uh, McSweeney's wasn't even the 
the the the first famous uh, hunger strike of his era. The you know the the the, the suffragettes in particular made use of it yeah. uh, as a very effective uh, tool um, because, as you say, part of it was that it wasn't a sudden death. It was a long lead up, and and with the, me the that's the you know work to the media of of, of the time, um, and and that was part of why it was so impactful. Um, besides the suffragettes and and obviously you know Republican prisoners, was it used elsewhere? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, I and I I, I I can go on and on about it, but um, most notably, um, Mohandas Gandhi uh, used a public fast in in Ahmedabad in 1918. Um, to marshal uh, public opinion um, for a, a strike um, and then began to use, use it regularly. He did not fast to the death. Um, the most famous earlier ones uh, had been um, what they called the Golodovka, a, a Russian or an Ukrainian form of fasting in prisons um, that was very inspirational to people in, in the UK, to, to people in Ireland as well. Um, and this was a, a, a form of desperate of, of desperation. It was a last ditch effort for prisoners to get blankets, um, to be treated uh, with some degree of humanity. And the most famous one of these were, were done um, in the 1870s and 80s and written about in England, uh, in America, um, and in Ireland. There also were, there were, uh, prisoners who had fasted in, in, in prison on protest previous to this, but they were not thought of in, in terms of public opinion. And that's where I draw the line and say um, that the suffragettes were the first. Um, what they did was uh, they wrote to the newspapers, they sent their photos to the newspapers before they went into prison. Uh, Marion Wallace Dunlop was the innovator of this. And her idea was that by, um, by showing vulnerability and fasting in a prison cell, the people, uh, the politicians may not listen to the women who are arguing uh, for the vote, but the people reading the newspapers would be moved. And it was a way of using emotion um, and the power of, of hunger, which is, which is very evocative, um, to move and pressure politicians. Uh, so that, thank you, Angus, for that question. Um, I, I, I can go on and on about it, but I we I I can if others um, have questions or or thoughts, I'd be happy to hear them. There's one in the uh, chat right now from Sandra Flowers. All right. So his, his, his position as mayor probably brought a greater attention. Was he in a better economic situation than most of his countrymen? I, that's a that's a fair point. It's a good point. Um, he was his wife came from um, a, a wealthy family, and um, they were brewers, I believe, uh, and they um, and so she was taken care of. In a sense, McSweeney knew that his wife and and child would be taken care of, but um, so he was in he was in a different position. Um, he did see himself as a, in that generation, as many did. Um, Patrick Pierce, many others um, saw themselves as um, as martyrs um, to, to not put too fine a point on it. And to get this into the newspapers and to um, do it in a very public way, he absolutely, because he was Lord Mayor, that brought a new level of, of political engagement. Um, here was a, a public official who was being treated as a common criminal. The, the differentiation between um, political prisoners and criminals had been a, a political football in, in England and across the British Empire um, for the previous 20 years um, since, and it had been um, since really the, the, um, the Land League Wars of the 1880s, which I won't get into. But the idea that um, he, he was a mayor and he was a public official that um, was starving for a cause and the cause, he had not done anything violent. He was a very religious man. He took communion daily. Um, this was seen as uh, really as, um, and it was, I don't wanna say it was orchestrated, but in part that, that it, it was. Um, 
as a, as a public figure? I believe that Cormac O'Malley had a question for you, Joseph. I'm sure Cormac has a great question <laughs> or, or a correction of, of something I said. <laughs> Go ahead, Cormac, we can hear you, I think. We should be able to. Uh, Cormac O'Malley, the, the son of, um, of Ernie O'Malley. So exactly. From France, I guess so. So Cormac, you can put the question into the into the the chat. While we're waiting, Joseph, I'll just ask you: Have you, since it's in Cork, and it was one of the most striking things that I've ever seen. Have you seen the cemetery in Skibbereen, the famine cemetery? I have not, I have not. In the center of town, there's a, there's a cemetery and they have roped off uh, an area of about in the middle of the cemetery, about a hundred feet by 200 feet. And it says within these sacred grounds, more than 9,000 people were buried here. Hmm. Mm. And it left that uh, mass impression that uh, we'll never right. forget. Right. So there's a couple other questions that have come in here. So did Bobby Sands and his colleagues try to connect themselves with McSweeney? Absolutely. Um, with McSweeney, with McCurtain, um, with the, even with the, the, the women's suffrage movement. Um, they also connected themselves with Gandhi. They were, uh, they saw themselves broadly. They have, they, even connected themselves to the, the ancient Irish tradition of fasting upon someone, which even St. Patrick did. Famously, um, St. Patrick, um, in order to obtain his freedom from slavery in Ireland, went to the mountain and fasted against God. Now, um, when we say fasted against God, it has a different meaning. Um, it was a combination of a legal term in, in uh, Brehan law and in, in Gaelic culture, one could fast upon someone in order to prove the justness of one's suit, of one's, of one's lawsuit. And so Patrick, in a sense, was, was doing that to prove that he should uh, be allowed to go free. Um, so there is a, there's an absolutely long tradition, and, and um, Bobby Sands tied himself to that tradition as well. Um, and then Charlie uh, Carl says, of course, there was Jesus's 40 days and 40 nights of fasting. Absolutely. And many other instances of, of fasting um, in, in the Bible. Um, and that sense of fasting for what in, in, in Irish, there's, there's two senses of fasting. There's trosku, this is old Irish, trosku and onya. And um, onya is that the sense of emptying oneself. Um, of a spiritual emptying. And that comes from, from Latin. Uh, it's a Latinate term and is rooted in the Bible. And that, that idea of a spiritual emptying and a spiritual cleansing, that's one side of fasting history. On another side in the hunger strike history is this sense of an injustice that one can appeal to those in power or to someone you disagree with by not eating. Um, so uh, here's Cormac's question, which landed in my inbox. Talk about the role of church and suicide because Ernie O'Malley was denied sacraments. That's, that's a great, great point, Cormac. Um, when McSweeney was dying, uh, and you know who's very good on this is, is Francis Costello um, in um, Enduring the Most, um, his book. But a number of people wrote about it. So early hunger strikers, um, uh, Catholic priests and, and bishops and cardinals were divided um, on whether this was suicide and whether they were sanctioning suicide. And the priest that gave the sacraments to McSweeney was hotly and roundly criticized for doing so, for facilitating suicide. This was the British position. And the British um, bishop, the Catholic bishop, whose name I've forgotten, um, was, the, was the most vociferous um, attacker um, on this. Later publications, really all the way until the 1980s, um, have argued that hunger strikes are, is a form of suicide and it cannot be sanctioned by the church. And yet many priests um, have supported or have um, in, uh, in one way or another. That's, that said, uh, McSweeney was one of the last to um, be able to uh, 
be directly supported by the church. Um, let's see. And then there, there is a lot on that. And there are a few good articles on that as well on suicide um, and how the church um, has, has argued um, at different times. So Roger Sullivan asks, what would the British government have had to do to convince McSweeney to end his hunger strike? They would have had to release him <laughs> to open the door and say, you're free to go. Um, that would have been uh, sufficient. Um, unlike uh, many of the, the British suffragettes when they were um, in prison, all they had to do was pay a fee. Indeed, many of them were there because they would not pay a, a nominal fee and many of these women could absolutely pay it. Um, and they were there um, as, a, as a matter of principle. McSweeney, however, was arrested for um, having in his possession a cipher um, a, 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 to break the code, listing all of the police, the Royal Irish Constabulary members in Cork. Now this is during the Anglo-Irish War. So even though he was Lord Mayor of Cork, they, it was treated as very suspicious for a Republican mayor to have a list of where the police lived um, and who they were because men, uh, police were being assassinated just as um, members of the IRA and Irish nationalists were being assassinated. So this was, um, he was seen not as a neutral agent, but as someone who was participating. And in all fairness, he probably was. Um, so let's see. After the fact, did the British government regret the decision to keep him in prison? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I would love to know the answer. There was regret um, articulated. Uh, the, the government did not put out a position on that that I know of, but um, people in the, in the Times of London certainly debated that. The, particularly um, after, the, after partition um, and after the treaty was, was formed, that said, um, did, did Margaret Thatcher never, <laughs> she never backed down from her um, refusal to uh, negotiate with, with um, those in, in the Mays prison um, and others in the, up in the North. Um, so to talk about role of church, McSweeney for some outright. Um, so I think that, um, I mean, Cormac would have a much better take on, um, on Ernie O'Malley's um, uh, history and, and, um, and his own hunger strike. Um, the hunger strikes did continue in the 1930s um, and in the, I believe in the 1940s as well, uh, in the 20s, 30s. And these were um, hunger strikes that normally did not end in, in death. Um, was it 73 or 74 days? Good question. He died on, uh, he died on the 74th day he lived 73 days on hunger strike. So uh, it's, a, it's a question of how we count it. Um, so yes, he, he, he survived 73 days. That's, that's the record. Um, others have apparently survived longer, but there's no, um, it, it's less, it's more dubious. Um, There's a there is so much about um, how hunger is linked to um, to the famine. Now, so Cormac's asked another: Who organized the Irish American funerals in October 1920 in so many cities? Well, um, the Terence McSweeney clubs. Um, I just had the the Philadelphia um, newspaper, but these were the they were uh, they were nationalist organizations um, associated with. Um, um, do, 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 uh, I, I'm, excuse me, Cormac, I'm forgetting the name of the organization. Um, I, I think it was the Friends of Ireland. Um, and, um, there are some, there are some good records about it, but the, I'd have to go back. I'd have to dig it up off the top of my head. I'm not sure. Friends of Irish Freedom. That's right. Um, can you comment on the impact of a death by fasting versus a sudden death by self-immolation by monks? So um, 
Yeah, it's a great question. There's there's a good bit of scholarship that's um, come out, um, particularly by political scientists, uh, on um, sacrificial um, political murders, self sacrifice. They call it self sacrifice um, murders uh, of self immolation and whatnot. The difference, the main difference, is that the hunger strike can be staged and uh, for, on a much longer time frame. McSweeney himself, a playwright um, and a poet, was very aware of the drama of the hunger strike and how something that could be kept in the headlines for so long. The difference between um, many of the previous hunger strikes, say those in Russia um, and the other, the other assassinations um, and uh, other events that would happen in the, in the Austro-Hungarian Empire as it as it fell apart um, and in Russia um, in the 1870s and 80s, were that these events came long after the hunger strikes had happened. That's when they hit the press. McSweeney, learning from the British suffragettes um, and from earlier Irish nationalists who had gone on hunger strike, knew that if they extended this, it would keep the topic in the news. And not only the topic, but the issue. Why were they in hunger strike? Because the question people would ask is, why won't they eat? What is the problem? Why won't they eat? Um, and so that was a way to prolong the discussion and extend the discussion. It also brought, I mean, the, the dynamics of a hunger strike in which you have someone who is, if, you, if you'll go with me for a second, a guest, a prisoner, albeit, but a guest in somebody else's house of corrections, in a house of, of penit a, a penitentiary, right, where someone is supposed to improve their morals, improve their, their standing. And that was the, very much the Victorian idea of the penitentiary. Um, if you have someone who is a guest in that house and they are refusing food uh, on moral grounds, it raised questions, and particularly in Ireland, um, on what was being done wrong in the prison system. The prisons up until about 1860 were not much better than dungeons. And the prison reform movement, the 1870s and 80s, started bringing these topics to light in which you had children going into prison with their parents, um, people having to provide their own food in prison, um, this sort of thing. Um, the British public wanted to change it. And so this, in a sense, built on that long it had been decades of discussion about what would make a good prison, what should happen in a prison, how should people be reformed in a prison. Um, and uh, so there's a whole um, um, a, a host of others. Uh, um, O'Donovan Rossa was a great, um, who was a prisoner in, uh, in the 1880s, 1870s and 80s um, during the Land League War. Um, and he, uh, reflected on what kind of protests could be done in, in the British prisons uh, to bring to light the, the poorness of the, um, of the conditions. So other than that, the, in terms of thinking about self-immolation, um, that occurs outside of a prison normally. Um, for the, hunger, the prison hunger strike to work as a part of a, an entire prison system, it threw onto the government, directly onto the government, um, the, the accusation that they were not treating people correctly, whether this was women in the case of the Irish and the British women's suffrage movement, or the case of Irish people in general with the Irish nationalist movement. And particularly for people like Terence McSweeney, who was not a soldier, who, um, was, uh, who saw himself as a leader and others looked up to him, but was, uh, was in a sense a failed, a failed playwright um, who uh, fell into a different, a different line. That's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> this is the problem with becoming, with being a professor. I'd like to thank you very, very much. Uh... Dr. Lennon for that, not only the presentation, but that great discussion uh, afterwards. And I would like to encourage 
you and your students, if you are in the Newport area, to please give me a ring and uh, we will take you on a tour of the Museum of Newport Irish History. Absolutely.